Good day and welcome to the Becoming a Family Focused System, Developing a Collaborative Service Array to Support a Family-Centered Approach Conference. Today's conference is being recorded. At this time, I would like to turn the conference over to Chris King. Please go ahead, sir. I will now turn it over to our facilitator today, Jennifer Marcelli. Thank you, Chris, and good morning or good afternoon to everybody, depending where you are in, in the country. Um, I wanted to just start with some introductions of the folks that you're going to hear from today. Um, so we have Honorable Judge John Rowley, um, who has been a leader in drug treatment courts for the past 24 years. His primary focus now is the Tompkins County Family Treatment Court, um, where that team continues to improve their support of families struggling with substance use disorder through evidence-based practices and trauma-informed responses. And then we have Mindy Thomas, who serves as the Family Treatment Court Coordinator in Tompkins County, New York, serving approximately 65 to 70 parents and their families who suffer from trauma and substance use disorder, along with coordinating a collaborative team of 25 to 30 members to facilitate the engagement in community resources to achieve increased health, safety, and permanency for all families. With 14 years of experience in social services, including child welfare, Deanna Bodner's work has focused on program development, implementation, data analysis, and evaluation. And then we have Teresa Lemus, is the director of the Family Treatment Court Training and Technical Assistance Program at Child and Family Futures. She is a nationally recognized expert in collaborative practice to improve outcomes for children and families. And we're also very lucky today to have on the call Brandon Schlosser, who is a young adult consultant with us at the Capacity Building Center for States. So next, um, I just wanted to quickly go over the agenda. Um, in a moment, I'm going to review the objectives for today's webinar. Um, and then you're going to hear from folks on, on the Tompkin, Tompkins County Family Treatment Court approach. Um, and you'll hear about their outcomes. Um, and then we're going to share with you some resources that we have at the Capacity Building Center for States. And then we'll also have an opportunity for a question and answer session with the speakers. So please feel free to type in questions as, we, um, as you hear from, from the presenters today. And we will um, get back to those at the end of the call. So before we get started, um, just wanted to talk quickly about um, the objectives for today's webinar. Um, you know, we really want you all to be able to identify strategies for building an organizational culture that really works collaboratively um, with families and community partners and service providers and stakeholders. Um, identify strategies for building and sustaining an organizational culture that supports healthy service array development. And increase awareness of some of the resources um, that we have available to support you in this work. So with all of that, I am going to turn it over um, to Judge Rowley. Thank you. Uh, this is John Rowley. <clears throat> I'm with the uh, Tompkins County Family Treatment Court, as your, my introduction uh, stated. I want to give you a, br a brief overview here as we uh, kind of set the stage for uh, today's call. Uh, we were lucky enough to uh, really revitalize or uh, significantly uh, change our practice starting uh, about five or six years ago. We'd been head of family treatment court for a number of years, and then we fell into the purview of children and family futures. Um, so I want to start off by uh, giving credit to them. This is a national organization uh, that is really leading the way of uh, both uh, collecting um, um, thinking about and I guess uh, then feeding back to us um, where we can go, what the vision is. Uh, their uh, mission is stated there before you. Their focus is on uh, families uh, in distress connected to uh, substance use disorder. And um, really, they're doing a remarkable job. Their focus um, and our focus today is um, on these key takeaways. That, and really, I think this is worth pausing for a moment because um, I don't think we often recognize the extent to which um, prejudice um, influences the way we respond. Uh, I've seen some uh, research where using the, no the words substance use disorder uh, versus addict or uh, uh, other kinds of uh, terminology 
will significantly affect the way treatment providers or um, medical professionals respond uh, to our families. So uh, this first point has particular meaning for, for me about um, what we think about uh, substance use disorder affects how the world responds uh, to these families. Uh, and this is a family-centered approach. Uh, this, this too is sensitive to us because as much as we thought we had a family-centered approach, um, the real definition of that uh, includes um, emphasizing the important um, uh, holistic uh, approach that's necessary to really address the whole system. Uh, it's easy to forget about children when you have parents in front of you. Um, we'll get more to that in a little bit. Um, the uh, systemic approach versus perception of readiness just has to do with uh, what's really going on and, and really having some objectivity about uh, looking at your systems. And of course, uh, we're all in this together. And again, that'll be emphasized further um, as we move along here. Uh, this uh, information is coming to you uh, through the Prevention and Family Recovery Initiative, which uh, the Doris Duke Foundation and the Duke Endowment funded. This was a real uh, far-sighted uh, program that uh, a number of courts around the country have now benefited from, and we certainly want to give them uh, credit for their vision. It's made a big difference to us. PFR, that's the uh, Prevention and Family uh, Recovery Initiative, um, really puts together all of these uh, components, uh, the cross-system collaboration, the evidence-based practice, and uh, the focus on uh, child abuse and neglect. Uh, this is a, a, a simple but um, really practical uh, summary of a mission because if you actually uh, do everything that's stated in that mission, um, I suspect you'll have a different result than what you're currently doing. That was our experience. Here's the uh, goals that uh, PFR uh, began with. Um, this is a matter of going out to existing family treatment courts, and I'm going to back up in a minute to make sure we're all on the same page when we're talking about the definition of family treatment courts. Um, going out to existing family treatment courts, looking at what they're doing, how they're doing it, and then um, really bringing them together to say, uh, are we fully uh, engaging our families? Um, are, we, uh, are we just taking the easy cases? Are we taking all the cases? Um, of course, that differs by jurisdiction, and, but capacity is always an important issue. And, and, and what are we doing? What, what is actually day-to-day -day happening um, to connect with parents, uh, to connect them with their kids so we can get families um, healing and moving forward together? What are you doing to evaluate this? We, I think we were probably better than most in Tompkins County at looking at our data, but we weren't doing nearly enough to really uh, measure what we're doing. And then uh, as a result of measuring what you're doing, then you can talk about um, what the lessons learned are and how you're going to benefit going forward from that. Uh, the original uh, PFR grantees are in the uh, tan or salmon color slides. And then there's four more, five more that have been added since then. So. Uh, we're all happy we were selected. And uh, you can look to these courts um, for their experience, if there are any that you're uh, connected to in any way. So we're going to start uh, at the beginning just to make sure that everybody on the call um, has the uh, same orientation. A family treatment court is not a criminal drug court. Um, this is not a criminal process. I, I shouldn't say that universally across the country. I'm speaking of New York State. But generally, these are civil proceedings. So we're talking about cases that come into the court system because of allegations of substance use, substance use by one or both parents that uh, is alleged to have uh, contributed to the neglect of the children. Um, the uh, family treatment court model then uh, differs from what would happen in most jurisdictions, which is simply the uh, engagement of attorneys and uh, attorneys for uh, child or uh, guardian ad litems, whatever the various models are. and uh, having a trial, having some kind of a dispositional order, and then you know, hoping that parents um, will take advantage of that. This is a completely different approach. Or I, I think the one way to capture it would be to say that um, 
we're trying to take responsibility, we being the uh, court system with all of our partners, uh, to really uh, put together an opportunity for families to address uh, their needs given what they're bringing, which is strengths and, and many strains, many uh, areas where um, they have not been functioning well uh, because of uh, past history, past trauma, and a variety of barriers that uh, often uh, poor families or uh, otherwise um, uh, struggling families uh, are faced with. The uh, model itself will come out more, I think, just through the description of it. Here's a, uh, a graphic of it. Uh, we have our families, um, once they come into family treatment court and have a uh, final order of disposition, then they're appearing regularly in court. Uh, these uh, drug court hearings um, become therapeutic jurisprudence because of the nature of them. And this is uh, something that's been widely documented uh, in the evaluation literature now, that uh, having a parent in a courtroom appear before a, a judge with a therapeutic uh, orientation where the uh, judge is actually focused on what is working for the parent and uh, is interested, is engaged, uh, projects uh, you know, caring, uh, empathetic uh, demeanor, that this will create um, better outcomes. Uh, it will help to uh, uh, empower parents to uh, increase their motivation and actually um, directly impacts uh, what happens with the family. Of course, that's not the whole picture by any means. Uh, person with substance use disorder uh, has to be able to access treatment. Our focus, of course, is on uh, that being quality treatment. And then the, the fourth component up here, the enhanced family-based services, that's a lot of what we're going to be discussing today because that's a lot of what we changed. Uh, we changed a lot of everything, but that's, uh, those are the single biggest area of services that we changed. So again, I don't want to spend too much time on these things, but I do want to make sure you all understand family treatment court if you're not familiar with it. Uh, we have to identify families. Um, we do that by notification from uh, Department of Social Services, your ACS, or whatever it's uh, designated in your state, identifying at the time of filing that this is a family that's affected, uh, alleged to be affected by substance use disorder. Timely access to treatment, treatment services. There's no magic here. Uh, it's common sense, but it's also proven. Um, the faster parents who are uh, in need of substance use treatment are offered uh, effective treatment, the more likely they are to stay in that treatment and to be successful in it. The longer the delay, uh, the worse the outcomes. Uh, increased management of recovery services and compliance with treatment, that has to do with the uh, whole team approach where you're having treatment counselors and uh, coordinators, um, case managers who are all um, on the same page in the sense that they're conveying uh, their own version of the same message about um, support and uh, challenge, uh, responding to challenges. Um, there's a lot of soothing that goes on. There's an awful lot of distress. If we take the typical case uh, where, in fact, uh, parents are coming into family treatment court following uh, a removal of their child or children, uh, many of these cases, uh, especially these days, are happening at birth, um, there's a great deal of distress um, and uh, it, it's, uh, it's a tough place to start, but um, we, so we do have to uh, engage parents in a way that um, helps them to focus on moving forward you know, while they're dealing with their own uh, grief and, and literally trauma from having a child removed. So we're, we kind of start with a couple strikes against us. The improved family-centered services and parent-child relationships, again, will come up during our discussion. Increased judicial oversight, I've described. Um, I want to talk more about that at some point, but I think I'll uh, wait till later because we've been changing the things within the last couple of years, which I think are uh, certainly of interest to me, and I think that they may be of interest to you because they're um, quite different than our prior approach. The contingency management systemic response, that has to do with therapeutic responses for uh, uh, behavior, uh, so whether it's um, not coming to court, whether it's um, um, missing treatment appointments, um, we're trying to have a positive uh, response, in other words, one that creates an incentive to change that behavior. 
um, and trying to be as consistent as we can, given the fact that these are all individuals with individual circumstances. Uh, that, of course, is an area of great uh, discussion and debate, but it's an important component. And finally, that um, it, we, we uh, have to have uh, consistent communication across our teams um, because the uh, uh, situations, uh, circumstances are changing constantly. Uh, we're just, in some ways, just trying to keep up. And I think it's also import, important for this co collaborative, non-adversarial approach uh, to result in parents' attorneys, attorney for the children, attorney for social services, all uh, pulling in the same direction. Uh, I think one of the areas we've been most successful in is around um, the more um, crisis uh, management response when a parent um, has lapsed or is um, facing some significant challenges um, that we're all, uh, that nobody's um, hiding information if the appropriate thing to be doing is um, uh, disclosing and uh, working together. So oh, this is Dina Bodner uh, with uh, uh, Department of Social Services in uh, Tompkins County, and so we're a key partner with uh, the Family Treatment Court and make referrals. So with the PFR grant that we received in 2014, um, the goals of it were really to um, focus on changing the entire system um, so that our entire system of all agencies uh, and the court working with families to have a more family-centered approach. And ultimately, this, crea this created a, a shift in our entire culture in how we work with families. Really what happens if you take this approach and that's your goal, each time you make any change in your system, it'll force you to then make other changes to continue to work with families in a family-centered way. For us, it was by first adding uh, a couple of key evidence-based parenting and children's services. As we added those, which we'll talk, to, talk about them more specifically later, we then needed to bring that information to the team. As we were bringing that information to the team, um, it generated more discussion about how to work with families and uh, with not just focusing on parent recovery, but considering child welfare, the family unit as a whole. So each step we took led to a new step. And, and it's still, as we talk later, you'll see we're continuing to change the system. Um, and, uh, and our partners meeting with them regularly to continue to, to think about how can we think about this in a, in a larger systems view rather than just focusing on family recovery. So the key here is to, to shift the focus from just focusing on the parent's recovery and how can you think about treating the parent and the child together as a unit, listening more to the families and, give, and their feedback in the process of what's happening both with services and in terms of working with them in the treatment court uh, framework itself. And to the best of our ability to also involve uh, foster resource families, kinship caregivers. So again, as you, as you increase your involvement of each of these, it requires you to then think about and incorporate more information as you go. We're going to uh, just uh, as a reminder about the uh, as for timelines, um, I expect most of the people on the call are all too familiar with this. This is the uh, federal mandate which says that children are entitled to uh, safe and stable homes, uh, to permanency. This has a uh, very direct impact on the work we do in our family treatment courts uh, because the, uh, uh, the time for uh, parental recovery and the time for uh, return of uh, children home safely are not necessarily the same at all. Of course, uh, as we all know, there are some areas of flexibility, um, but there's not a lot. And uh, I think it's the most important thing that we try to emphasize with our parents um, is the fact that uh, social services are required by law to be doing concurrent planning, which means when the relative comes in, when a teacher comes in, when other placement resources put their hand up, we have to look at them and, and uh, look at them seriously 
um, as resources, but that um, our goal is to return children home. I don't think uh, it ever works to uh, threaten families, uh, threaten parents around this, um, but it's a, it, in some sense it's a harsh reality. We'll occasionally have a parent finally kind of wake up in recovery at eight or ten months, and um, that's pretty far down the line uh, with the uh, Adoption and Safe Families Act uh, time clock. So this uh, highlights in a different way uh, that point, uh, the 12 months for uh, unification, the, uh, the fact that uh, infants uh, or children of any age uh, are deeply affected by the separation. And I think that we're getting better at recognizing um, the, the negative impact on parents of um, the separation from their uh, children. Uh, of course, uh, these systems also include uh, families where the children have not been removed. Um, so it has its own uh, particular variations. Um, but the uh, treatment and recovery process uh, does take time. And of course, if there's not sufficient progress, um, the, uh, even the children who are at home, uh, that situation is not going to uh, stay that way. So, um, so the key focus in working together on a family treatment cord, so there's, there's our five kind of main, main key goals, outcomes that we're focused on. One is uh, the parent's recovery uh, from, su and from substance use. Um, to the best of our ability, when possible, to have the children remain at home while they're in treatment and engage with the family treatment court. Um, to reunify families as quickly as possible, uh, to reduce in, uh, any types of um, repeat maltreatment that might occur due to substance use, and to prevent reentry into uh, foster care. So as the judge mentioned, um, the family treatment court team is a multidisciplinary team, so you have attorneys, child welfare workers, um, treatment, attorneys for children, a whole array of service providers, all of whom have see these different aspects from a different angle, a different point of view. And so we don't all necessarily uh, have the same goals professionally uh, based on roles, but the key is having the same vision and eye on um, child welfare and parental recovery and returning the children as quickly as possible. I would say one of the key things that shifted for us under the PFR is that um, before, prior we were looking at all the risk factors involved with the family um, that we were trying to address. But when we shifted the focus to child safety and returning children as soon as possible while, they were, while parents were in recovery and still making sure the children were safe, that helped us think even more of, in a family-centered way about what strengths the families had, how could we work with those, how could we support those more. And so that focus helped bring the team together and, and have sort of a more common vision in terms of what we were doing. All right, we're going to turn to some uh, specifics here, again, uh, making sure we're all uh, thinking together about this. I love this definition uh, that SAMHSA put together. I'm really uh, proud of uh, uh, our government's uh, work on this one. Uh, of course, I'm the last person to read uh, slides to you, but I do want to read this. Recovery is a process of change through which individuals improve their health and wellness, live self-directed lives, and strive to reach their full potential. I, mean, I just think that's a great uh, definition. and. Uh, uh, added to that, of course, is the access to evidence-based substance use disorder treatment and recovery support services are important building blocks to recovery. Um, this, this can't happen in a vacuum. If uh, willpower uh, would uh, solve the problem, our parents would have, uh, would have done that. Um, this is another um, uh, expansion of that, kind of taking the components and, and broadening in them. So, uh, and again, we're, we're back to basics. You know, we're, we're back to hierarchy of need. 
Um, if we have to have stabilization in our parents, um, uh, of course, in, uh, we're in uh, New York State. We're dealing with the opiate use disorder uh, problems in a uh, hugely significant way. Uh, but whatever it is, um, we have to have stability where parents are uh, actually in a position uh, to participate in substance use treatment at whatever level uh, of need that they have. They have to have a safe home for uh, their own stability. Uh, they have to be able to be safe themselves before they're going to be able to provide a safe home for their children. And then um, and the purpose and community components here, I think, really get to what uh, uh, we've been trying to convey for a long time, which is, you know, this is about you know, kind of why are we here and where are we headed. Uh, and I think that uh, the empowerment of parents has to include, you know, holding out uh, this kind of hope that uh, if you can uh, get to this place where your substance use disorder is being uh, treated, and uh, things start to get stable for you, uh, that your life uh, can have meaning in a way that it maybe has not had for a long time. Of course, we have people that go from relative stability, stability to instability, but uh, as far as the parents that we have, as that we track, um, we're talking about often multi-generational uh, neglect and abuse. Uh, many of our parents were in uh, foster care or in alternative placements. Many come from uh, very uh, difficult uh, home lives. Many have had uh, contact with the uh, family court system long before they um, had children. Um, uh, so th they may not have experienced meaningful daily activities. Um, and, uh, and ultimately, uh, you know, th this is our community. Uh, these folks are us. And so that um, uh, when they are fully able to participate as families, that we're talking about uh, people who do have the resources uh, when times are getting tough, when they're getting shaky, uh, when the stresses of day-to-day -day life are giving them a hard time, they've got uh, social networks uh, that they're able to, uh, to rely on, just like we all do. So here's a uh, uh, quick slide on um, treatment that supports the family. Um, what it means is, uh, what the slide is uh, conveying is that uh, within substance use treatment, we have to be, we have to insist that our treatment providers are, are treating families. Uh, we have. Um, seen that, and I'm sure many of you have seen that, it's very easy to get focused on individual. And I think uh, generally people would say that our criminal drug courts are focused on individuals. Um, but if we're not seeing uh, parents uh, within the family system and we're not supporting them within that family system, we're missing a lot because the, uh, when you, if you start talking about uh, lapse or relapse into substance use or other kinds of uh, crises, uh, those are so often related to uh, relationship uh, issues, the stress and distress with regard to their children. Um, and so I, I think that and, uh, I think our work would suggest that uh, always viewing uh, these individuals in the context of their role as parents um, is going, it, while they're in the treatment system, um, is going to uh, improve uh, the outcome of that. So, so we're going to now get into a little bit more of the, the details about how we actually shifted our system um, to, with the goal of really having um, integrating family-centered uh, approach in, in all aspects of, of our treatment court and our uh, partner provider agencies. Hi, this is Mindy, I'm the Family Treatment Court Coordinator here in Tompkins. I'm going to focus on some evidence-based practices. Um, evidence-based practices focus on improving parent-child relationships. The evidence-based services we added offered parents opportunities to have interactions with their children while developing their parenting skills. Um, our amazing service providers that we have here in Tompkins provide us updates on how the families 
um, skills and relationships are improving. Um, they provide us updates on a regular basis to our children's service coordinator along with myself and then those updates are shared to our entire team so we all have a complete understanding on what our families are receiving. By having the evidence-based programs, it allows us to have a clear, consistent structure of the services across the families as well as fidelity monitoring. Our um, families are offered different evidence-based practices. Um, some of them that are offered for our families include safe care, CPP, child parent psychotherapy, and strengthening families. Dean is going to get more in depth and talk about these three different programs in a little bit but they are common practices that we are using on a daily basis with our families. All right, it's time to have some fun. We are going to uh, have a polling question. If you haven't done this before, I think you'll enjoy it. It gives us an opportunity to uh, come to understand a little bit more about uh, our audience. Uh, please uh, look at the uh, poll before you and uh, we'll let some results come in and um, we'll help inform uh, the rest of our discussion. So the uh, first question, for those of you who don't have the screen in front of you, is what is your experience with family treatment courts or other types of cross-system collaboration? Uh, just as the numbers are roughly coming in, look at about 20% have no experience at all, 45% uh, with some experience, 23% uh, is a good amount, 12% with a lot. Um, the uh, second question is an open-ended question, which of course will give us a uh, 563 open-ended answers. Uh, the question is, what challenges have you encountered in collaborative practice? Uh, and we're going to uh, take a minute and try to um, just respond to some of the uh, comments that are coming in. I'd also suggest that if you have a, um, a particular question, uh, at the end we're going to be taking questions. There's too many people on the line to do it uh, live. Uh, by voice, so we'll be doing it by uh, written questions, but feel free to, uh, to do that. Um, communication uh, is coming up uh, number one. I'm not sure if you all are seeing this or not, um, but uh, uh, so I mean, it, it, it's a little bit hard to uh, uh, answer that question without more. I, I can say that um, it has uh, taken a tremendous amount of work to establish a system which honors all of the uh, restrictions. Uh, privacy, sharing of information, um, uh, who needs to be involved in what discussions, what information uh, the judge gets, what information he doesn't get, um, when, when there's differences of opinion, um, how those get resolved. Um, all of those are, um, are, are part of the experience. It's, it's like any other team uh, that, that starts off as a collection of people and not a team at all. And then over time, uh, and with uh, uh, a lot of hard work, starts making some um, uh, some progress with that. Uh, let me see if uh, feel free to let me know if you want to answer one of those. Sure. Uh, yes, Go ahead. I can add to the communication as well. Um, again, this is Mindy. Um, we get weekly updates from our treatment providers. They provide us treatment reports um, from our substance use outpatients along with our mental health outpatients along with all of our children's service service providers um, those all those communications are sent into myself um, I compile this information into what we call appearance summaries and this is what we review during our case review um, while we're discussing our families prior to our court sessions and these appearance summaries are then dispersed out um, to our partners so they can have an understanding of what's going on with our families. So we have an update from our caseworkers, treatment providers, children's service providers, and myself. Um, so we all can have a centralized um, hub of communication and we're all understanding what is going on with each one of our families and children. And, uh, this is Dina. So with regard to communication and collaboration. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit more um, after this about some of the specifics we did to help facilitate particularly where some conflicts in communication come up regarding differing goal, uh, goals that uh, 
roles on the team have, so we'll go into that. But I think a key thing is that we have regular weekly meetings where everybody on the team comes to the table and everybody has an equal voice in, in the process. Um, it took us some time to get there, and again, we'll talk about like different things we put in place to establish that. But it doesn't happen on its own. It really takes some uh, intention and uh, clear commitment and motivation of leadership um, from the court, from uh, child welfare, and from partner agencies. The motivating factor of the commitment, though, is the outcomes, better outcomes for children. So when, when one understands and sees the improvements you can have for families with substance use disorders using family treatment court, that itself helps motivate everybody to come to the table, stay at the table, and really work out some of the issues that we needed to to be able to communicate and really collaborate effectively. So we're not going to spend much more time on this because we have a lot of material to cover, but I, I, it's kind of like uh, uh, going back through the bad old days looking at all your questions because we've been to all the places that I think that you suggest there, the uh, conflict and treatment recommendations, uh, the DSS uh, not being on the same page. That hasn't been our experience, but it is the common experience in our state and around the country too where um, all this is often personality differences. There's it's not unusual for there to be conflict between the court and social services, but uh, um, I think that's the single biggest key to our success has been the fact that uh, we have worked, uh, worked and worked and worked um, for that to be a productive relationship. Um, and of course, certainly not without its challenges, but uh, I don't think that it's possible for this to be successful without that, and I, would, uh, I think that's number one on the list. Let me just say, too, that uh, we are a peer learning court in Tompkins County, and uh, if there are specific questions for uh, myself, uh, Dina or Mindy, um, our contact information is available. I'll be happy to have um, follow-up discussion with that. Um, we're going to end the uh, polling part now and get back to the slides. Someone magically um, makes that happen. And now I will go to the uh, background for Tompkins County with capacity building. Uh, let me just uh, introduce this by saying that uh, uh, we had we were established our court in 2001, and even at that point, I was experienced in uh, in the drug court model, but not the family treatment court model, and they really are very different things. Um, and I think, despite our desire to be focused on the family, uh, it's just I think it's uh, the nature of the process that the parent is the one in front of us. The parents have the crises going on, the parents are the ones coming to the court, and we inevitably over time, um, despite our efforts, um, focused on only parent recovery. So we're going to start with a slide about that. So, yeah, so we found that um, once we started doing some more of the changes with the PFR grant of focusing more on children, we in child welfare know and have seen over time that um, including services and focus on child well-being is essential to working with the family together. And so, go to the next slide. Yep. So when, when the focus is only on parents, then you miss huge chunks of, of what's important with the family, important in particular with younger children, making sure that early intervention services are in place to address any kind of developmental needs, um, making sure that um, children who are in school are getting their uh, educational needs met. Um, we know that uh, a large number of our uh, PINs, our um, juvenile, case, juvenile justice caseload is related to um, some of our child welfare cases or children who were previously in foster care. Um, placement and residential treatment programs puts in a, a strain on families and children in particular. And then the children oftentimes um, develop their own substance abuse uh, disorders over time. Um, working in uh, Department of Social Services, 
So, so I oftentimes also work with our homeless population and our temporary assistance population. And so many times, now that I've been at the department for going on 15 years now, I've seen as people move, as children move through child welfare, they will later uh, show up in our um, homeless population or also um, come back into the child welfare system. So being able to address those issues early on when the families first come to, uh, to the treatment court and child welfare is essential to um, really shifting how we work with families in general in our community and improving everybody's well-being. So the uh, family recovery model, uh, it makes sense uh, on so many levels. Um, it's just hard to do. But the, uh, I think it is true to say that uh, if you have two parents with substance use disorder, uh, the children that they bring, uh, the children that they have and now come into our court system are at the, at the highest risk of any children in the community just by the genetics, much less the uh, trauma and experience. So uh, this is really an opportunity. Uh, it's a reality um, so that the, uh, our effort to um, recognize and to um, coordinate those services in a way that engages parents um, it's been an extremely important part of our uh, more recent success. Uh, we want parents uh, uh, to be identifying um, what's missing uh, in their skill set, uh, to be uh, stable in their uh, approach. Um, they want to be, and we want them to be uh, employed uh, as possible, having their needs met. Um, uh, but the main point being that uh, this has to be a vision uh, of family recovery, um, which means that all of our partners have to be involved, from the teen pregnancy program uh, to those serving uh, 18 to 24 year olds um, uh, facing homelessness, uh, to uh, our families who are uh, cut across in the criminal justice system as well into our family treatment court mental health with, uh, with co-occurring disorders. Uh, there's just a variety, wide variety of, uh, of needs here. So I just, as we moved into the PFR grant, the number of people on our team increased. Um, as the judge was saying, as we began to include different service providers who are working with our families. So now we have a mental health liaison. We actually have two different mental health agencies in the community. We have a third agency that does uh, comprehensive uh, assessments. Our domestic violence uh, services agency has a liaison who comes. And then, of course, we have our substance abuse liaisons. Um, we have early intervention with child uh, development who periodically come. We have discussions with housing agencies. So, so the number of um, partners, if you're really going to do this, increases, and you have to keep hearing their voices, listening to their concerns, and, and working with, with them, with your partners, as well as working within the core team. And here is a depiction of the uh, collaborative capacity. This is actually, um, when you break it down, uh, proved to be very useful to us. Um, and some of you in your participant chat were raising these issues uh, as well. You know, are we on the same team? What, what do we see our roles at? What are we missing? And uh, I think if you did this kind of as a, uh, um, uh, with a secret polling, and you had everybody put down what, you, what your job was and you think the other team member's job was, uh, there might be a bit of a, a disagreement there. So we had to work that out. We had to come up with a common mission statement. We had to really put on the table what our goals were. And as Dina said earlier, I think our values uh, were very much uh, aligned. Um, but we had to understand um, the, the mission of the, of the different agencies. And, and of course, because that, that creates the, uh, the tension. And the tension is inevitable. And it's just a question of whether or not it's going to be uh, productively responded to or it's going to be uh, it's gonna be the end of your effort. The conducting system walkthroughs, uh, I'm going to ask Mindy to talk about that. Um, uh, because we had a system walkthrough that I think was really effective. 
Um, I wasn't on a team when it occurred, so I think it, it's helpful to hear my perspective because that is one of the common things I hear about when um, Tompkins started the PFR grant. And I've heard a lot of um, results due to that trauma walkthrough, um, right down to our core officers changing their approach when they approach one of our participants or family members that are in the courtroom or in the courthouse to our residential treatment facility that's in the area attempting and doing different techniques to make sure we are being trauma informed and ensuring the safety for all of our family members that are involved. I wanted to pick up on the uh, uh, drop-off analysis just to pick out one more from these where uh, it's a simple uh, uh, upside down triangle, right? Everybody who's potentially eligible is on top. Your next box down is, you know, how many got referred. Next box is uh, how many uh, actually uh, came into the program, uh, and then right down the line. And uh, it, it's it's so meaningful. It's, it's such a simple uh, model, but it's so meaningful. I think if you spend time on, you know, why did we go from this number at the top to the next number to the next number, and really digging into that. It's just a, uh, um, I think, an essential uh, but pretty simple way to come to understand what impact we're having and why. You know, where are we losing people? What's happening? And, and, and what's the cause of that? What, what can be changed? What can't be changed? Yeah, um, and then the use of data was really important for us in terms of first establishing what our baselines were. So this is a little bit related to what the judge talked to. But then seeing it helps you then identify where, what goals you have, where you want to change things, and then what changes you need to make. Um, and we'll talk later um, in, the, in, the, in the slides about some of the specifics of how we use data and the, how our outcomes change. So here is a, uh, uh, just I think a nice uh, compilation of uh, uh, systems. Uh, the uh, program on the left, I mean the uh, descriptions on the left are kind of where we were and the uh, system on the right, uh, the list on the right is uh, where we are today. Uh, let me just pick out um, one uh, checklist oriented versus milestone oriented. This is actually uh, both a, uh, a concept and uh, something that's happened in reality for us. Uh, many of you may be uh, familiar uh, if not, you can envision a uh, simple phase-based program. Uh, you come into a program, you're in phase one. When you've done enough, you're in phase two. When you've done enough, you're in phase three, and then phase four, or whatever it is, before you finish the program. Um, and that's where almost all the criminal drug courts started and remain. That's where most of the family treatment courts started and remain. Uh, but we have been working for a couple of years now with milestone uh, based program. We didn't make this up, um, but we've uh, created our own set of milestones. And this is uh, really recognition um, that we, we want to give more uh, power uh, to the parents, have them more control over uh, the progress, the, the rate of progress, and also uh, uh, to have them um, be able to uh, monitor that simply by looking down at a milestone uh, sheet. So here we're talking about something like, how does a parent progress from supervised parenting time to unsupervised parenting time? What do they have to accomplish? And um, we're, we're looking, we're focused very much on the actions and behaviors of the parents. How are they presenting? What are they doing? Where they are? Where are they in their uh, substance use treatment? Um, how have their uh, parenting time? Uh, Provides parenting time and going, those kind of things. But what we're trying to get away from, uh, I don't mean to say meaningless checklists, but checklists that can lose their meaning compared to milestones, which are specifically talking about what behaviors, uh, what actions and behaviors are necessary to make progress when you've come into a program uh, where the court has made a finding that uh, it's not safe for you to be around your children. Go ahead and keep moving here. Um, uh, so, to some specifics. Yeah, so these are the initial changes we made in services we added under the PFR grant. So we added two parent, parenting and uh, children's services, uh, strengthening families, which is a evidence-based uh, program that works specifically, was designed for and works specifically with families with substance use disorders. 
Uh, we focused on the age group from uh, 6 to 12 years old. We added safe care, which is another evidence-based um, intervention that works with children uh, under 5 years old. It's a structured uh, curriculum that focuses on uh, child, safe, child health, home safety, and parent-child interactions. Um, the key with these is that they both have um, fidelity monitoring. Um, they're very structured. They're evidence-based. Um, sometimes we get a little pushback from families because of the structure, but we've held to them and, and we've had like amazing improvements and outcomes with some of our families. So with Safe Care, I actually recently analyzed the data pr just prior to implementing Safe Care. And we had about 40% of children ages 0 to 5, if they didn't uh, participate in safe care, were returned home. When parents successfully uh, completed safe care, 80% had their children returned home. We also offered uh, inclu uh, added a parent-child services coordinator position to really keep their focus on making sure we were getting the referrals to these services, doing follow-up with them, getting feedback, and then coming to the team and actually reporting on what's happening with the children. And this was really a key factor in changing um, uh, how the team was functioning and keeping our focus on, on, child, on children and families. We also uh, changed practices within the family treatment court uh, process, team processes. As the judge mentioned, we reviewed and clarified our family treatment court mission and the roles of each uh, team member. Uh, this helped us develop a clear single um, goal vision that everybody keeps their eye on, um, while also making sure we um, uh, understand the differences in the roles, the goals of individual roles. Uh, and we regularly um, have a facilitator come in and review those about every four to six months just because there's turnover in the team. And it's just very easy with the ongoing day-to-day -to, -day to kind of lose track of that. We've implemented uh, what's called training and solution-focused trauma-informed care. This has really uh, significantly changed the culture and how uh, everybody interacts with the, the clients, talks with them, interacts with each other in the team. The judge can maybe talk about this a little bit yeah. more. Yeah, so this is what I was uh, referring to earlier about my own transformation with my approach. Um, I think it's easy to think of uh, a typical approach where I've got all the information. Uh, we've got a well-coordinated system. I have all the information in front of me. And uh, the typical drug court model is these conversations happen in the courtroom between uh, the adults and the court, um, but not with the attorney speaking. Uh, this is a conversation uh, or an interrogation, depending on how you approach it. Um, so it would not be unusual for me to uh, have a parent get called, have them come up to a podium. I'm up on the bench, uh, elevated bench. Uh, it's obviously formal um, in that way, no matter how informal I want to be. It's a formal setting. And, uh, and I would just start with uh, the deficits. Uh, you missed a couple of treatment appointments this week. Uh, what's going on with that? I mean, I'm trying to, and that, that's a, that's a, a kind of a backward supportive way, uh, but that's uh, immediately uh, negative and deficit focused. Um, the solution focused trauma informed uh, care is a uh, emerging model um, that uh, has been really transformative, as Dina said, because it affects uh, the whole system when it's working right from child protective all the way through the interactions in the courtroom. Just to give you a, a sample of how that's changed, and this kind of happened uh, organically where I, I stopped going on the bench and I took the podium and the parents stay out in the audience. We have all of our parents in at the same time. I know different people have different models for different reasons, but our parents can stay in the audience. They can be sitting with their uh, peer support person or anybody else. And uh, my first question to them is typically going to be, you know, how are you feeling today? Um, you look like you're a bit rushed. What's going on? Um, uh, what, are your, uh, what are your goals for today? Uh, what do you hope to accomplish? What's been keeping you up um, at night? Um, yeah, you know, just really trying to uh, um, 
create an atmosphere of, of care and of concern. And um, it, it's not uh, uh, unusual uh, for people with substance use disorder to um, have been raised or have lived in an environment where it's up to them to figure things out. The single biggest challenge uh, is to have people actually identifying uh, when they uh, are in trouble or when they need help or when things are slipping and then accepting that help. If people will, so the first, our first thing we tell people, uh, kind of the number one family treatment court is engagement. If you come in and will be open uh, enough to uh, that conversation, uh, then there's a chance here. And uh, if, if they, if we can uh, demonstrate to them that we're serious, we're serious about uh, helping them uh, make the decisions they identify as being important to them, taking the, the steps to get there, um, then they don't walk away feeling like uh, they've been re-traumatized. And, and I've talked to a number of, of people who appeared before me, and uh, as nice as a guy as I like to think I am, um, I, the people will say things like, I don't remember anything you said to me, Judge. It was so traumatizing. Every time I had to go up there and speak to you, I don't even remember what you said. Um, and uh, that's not the atmosphere in the courtroom anymore. Uh, I think this is a, a huge change, and I'd be interested in talking more with any judges or other people who are interested in that shift, because I think it's, um, I think we're breaking some new ground with that. Um, we've also substantially changed the way we did our case review, and I'm going to ask Mindy to review that with you. Yeah, Dean already shared with you a little bit about that, um, having a structured case review. Um, we have multiple partners, community supports in the case review. Um, it's a round table. We're all sitting around at the table. Um, CSS is a major partner of ours. We could have up to 11 um, individuals in the case review from the Department of Social Services providing updates and feedback on how our families are doing. We have our respondents' attorneys present, our attorney for children's office present our liaison and um, an advocate focusing on domestic violence. And what I do is I focus, um, I call the case and our child is the primary focus. The child or the children is the center of the communication happening in the room. Um, I will call on the caseworker first. The caseworker working with the family will provide an update on how the family is doing. I will then call on the assistant caseworker so she can share about how parenting time is going. I will then call on the children's service coordinator so she can share about the evidence-based programs that our families are currently involved in and provide an update on how those services are going. I then go to the attorney for children's office where either the attorney or the social worker who works for the attorney for children's office will provide an update on anything they want to add or advocate on behalf of their client or inquire about a service or request a service to be added. I will then go to our liaisons, whether it be with substance use treatment, mental health, or um, our advocacy center. I then go to our respondents' attorneys who can advocate on behalf of their client. And then on the caboose that provides um, any type of other updates that may need to be um, reported upon. I may have just seen them that morning. I can provide an update on what's going on that day or most recently, including um, drug testing, reporting, presentation, approaches, um, actions and behaviors. And of course, the judge provides support, inquiries, final decisions while we're talking about the cases right then and there. So we've got about uh, 27 minutes left, and we've, uh, there's some other things that happen at the end, and we want to do some questions. So we're going to be a little bit uh, quicker in going through this. I already mentioned the milestone approach. Um, let's get to our next uh, polling question. For those of you who don't have this in front of you, in your community, do families involved with child welfare who suffer from parental substance use disorder have the support they need? to reunite and have improved well-being. Um, and if you say yes, we want to come see your community. Um, and the second question is, do substance use disorder treatment providers in your jurisdiction support child welfare workers when both are involved with the same family? That's a very uh, interesting question. Uh, so uh, we're just starting to get uh, 
the responses coming in. Of course, the, uh, the first question really uh, does tell you, um, it kind of gives you the answer within the question, but um, this is where Family Treatment Court uh, started from, and we continue to maintain that uh, Family Treatment Court, um, this model reflects the diligent efforts that the law uh, requires of us. That if we're saying to parents, here's a choice for you, you can either come into a program which is going to closely supervise you, support you, um, give you evidence-based programming, um, is going to, on a weekly basis, make uh, changes to your parenting time, make those kinds of decisions, or you can go do it like we've done it before, which is you see your caseworker when, you, when, she, when he or she directs you to appear, you see your counselor when you're supposed to, and if it doesn't work after a year, it will file a TPR. Um, that TPR issue is what first motivated us to get started. So uh, I maintain that the Family Treatment Court is, um, is the model that we should be talking about. Most of you are answering no, uh, of course, to the first question. The second question I think is interesting as well. Do substance use disorder treatment providers in your jurisdiction support child welfare workers when both are involved with the same family? This has been uh, not a, a simple answer for us either. Um, we have had to tackle um, some perception that uh, uh, the individual is the person receiving the treatment, uh, not uh, the parent in the context of the family. Um, but I do encourage you, uh, those of you in both, uh, both parts of that system, uh, to open up that discussion. One of the things that uh, we'll reflect on a little bit is the fact that uh, we had to bring uh, the various levels of leadership in in order for us to move uh, this, progress, this uh, process along. We have to have the executive directors, we have to have the uh, uh, clinical directors, we have to have the line staff. I'll, I'll uh, working together. We're going to uh, close this question now. We're going to talk about the actual work. Um, and uh, you've heard about most of these already. Then we've mentioned the parent-child psychotherapy, comprehensive psychosocial assessments. That has to do with creating a position. So very early on, as soon as we have stability, uh, we are having a comprehensive evaluation done to give us information on how we should approach a particular parent. Um, I can say that uh, uh, my experience of this is that the, the documentation of the losses our parents have uh, experienced, uh, the trauma that they've experienced is really uh, quite remarkable. And, it, and when it translates into specific uh, strategies for helping support a family, it's, uh, it's extremely helpful. Of course, I'm hoping all of you are focused on the ACEs, the adverse childhood experiences uh, data, which is out there, we are tracking that for our parents. Unfortunately, most of our parents are in the 6 to 7 to 10 range for their ACEs score. So those of you are familiar with that. Um, I'm going to go ahead on to the uh, next slide. I can make that happen. Uh, we did create a fathering program. I'm going to ask Mindy to comment on that. Yeah, we did some different approaches to engage our fathers into the program. Um, one of the ways that we did that was having an all-male court session um, around Father's Day. We do do it for our mothers as well. We'll have an all-female court session around Mother's Day. Um, the first time we did this, it was very um, eye-opening on the homes that our fathers were raised in and the relationships that they have with their own fathers or lack thereof or none of or no knowledge of. Um, it was uh, very traumatizing all of us involved, I can't imagine our fathers who had to live in it. Um, we have a new program that started. We touched on it earlier. It's called Amazing Dads. Um, we were the pilot program for this. Um, this program has been very beneficial for our fathers. We actually have an alumni that stemmed from the Amazing Dads program where our dads um, continue to decide to meet monthly. Um, after the 15 sessions that they completed together, um, after those 15 sessions, they had an actual graduation from the program. Um, they're still connected with the facilitators of that group, Tommy Miller and Gail Smith, and our dads um, build on those relationships and continue to stay involved in each other's lives.
Child Development Council also has a DAD program. It's called Teen Dad. This is an open group, and our dads are able to join at any time. Um, this is open to them to attend on a weekly basis. There is an incentive to this program as well for our dads. And the thing I'd like to also add is we do have peer support that we were able to um, gain through our SAMHSA grant, and that's been a key component for our families. And one of our peer supports is a graduate from Family Treatment Court. Um, so he is able to be an ongoing support for our dads in the program, provide them with daily, any type of daily obstacles or um, barriers that they may be going through. Um, he is able to help them and support them throughout the way. I'm going to move on to um, uh, a couple of more slides that we think are important for you to see. Uh, this is uh, kind of a summary of a variety of points. We're not going to spend much time on it other than to say that a current focus of ours is to try to really uh, engage our foster parent or kinship caregivers. Uh, we're, we're calling them uh, resource parents now uh, in the sense that uh, they, they have to be part of the picture. Uh, sometimes they are. Sometimes it happens naturally. Far too often it does not. Um, and we want to improve that because uh, they're a tremendous, first of all, they're a tremendous resource because they're providing a safe home to these children. Uh, but there's a tremendous opportunity for partnering with our parents. Um, I'm going to go on to the capacity building uh, because this is uh, really the exciting stuff. Like, how do, what happens when you do all the things that we've done? Dina? So I just want to say you being able to track uh, your data and your outcomes uh, can really help support the development of your program. Um, you can use the data in, in uh, creative and helpful ways. We were able to look at, early on, we looked at the differences in the outcomes for our two treatment agencies, and that led to some discussions uh, with leadership at, at one of the agencies that was uh, falling behind and have helped to make some changes over time. Uh, we've tracked the effects of the outcomes of using safe care and strengthening families to see how those have improved the outcomes of our families. And they also, at certain times, give a reality check to the team, because sometimes, oftentimes team members will be struggling with specific cases, and that case will do, view will dominate some of the discussion, but if you can kind of pull the team back to look at the overall outcomes, it kind of helps ground what's going on. Um, we've developed a dashboard um, that every quarter, uh, every three or four months, we look at some uh, specific outcomes of the, of the program. Uh, we developed the, the dashboard with the entire team, so we asked attorneys, attorney for children, other folks what was important for them. And so uh, it helps the whole team keep an eye on what's happening um, and what services how um, we might want to change the program or services if we, if we see areas that, that are uh, falling behind. So this is a graph that shows you how our outcomes have changed over time. So the dark bars are before um, the uh, PFR grant, and then uh, the green bars are uh, during the implementation of PFR. And then uh, the hash bars are since the end of PFR and the beginning of our SAMHSA grant. And you can see we had a substantial shift uh, increase in, in our graduations and reduction in our surrenders uh, during the PFR grant. We've maintained uh, that level of graduation under the SAMHSA grant now. And now we've had a big shift um, uh, even a greater reduction in our surrenders and a reduction in cases we transfer to uh, relative custody and permanency um, for families. So let me just make a comment in, on that. Uh, I know there's been a question about uh, Family First and what impact Family First has on all of this. I, I think that this slide uh, shows you some of the direction we're going to need to be moving, um, the relative custody emphasis, for example, um, but at least our experience in New York uh, family First is still being digested at the state level, and uh, we have not seen any specific direction yet. Whether it's already required of us or not is a different thing, but um, I just want to let you know that we haven't had direct impact yet. And then this 
slide just shows some additional data since uh, the ending of PFR um, and some of the recidivism back into family treatment courts, so especially with the opioid epidemic and uh, how difficult it is to, to maintain uh, abstinence or even just uh, not relapsing. Uh, we've had some um, cases that have come back into family treatment court or have had additional petitions. So this has changed, again, sort of changed some of our culture and how we, we approach things, but we're still, 70% um, of our cases have had no, no previous family treatment court. So looking at this data is helping us to think like what are some of the next steps, what are some of the new changes we want to make to, to um, reduce any recidivism that we might have. So sustainability, uh, my brief comment would be build your program and then we'll work on how you continue it. Um, it, it, it takes work every day, but uh, if you build success, you got a lot better chance of sustaining success. Yes. So I just, with the sustaining collaborations, it just, it really is important to keep your focus on the, on, on the relationships and keeping positive, strong, productive relationships with key partners. Conflicts will continue to come up, but staying committed to uh, the recovery of the families and uh, outcomes for children will help keep those relationships on track. It's like putting some of the other stuff aside and saying, coming back to the, to the collaboration, to the relationship and saying, we need to keep working on this, I think is, is so core to being yeah. able to sustain a really good, healthy collaboration. We're going to wrap um, this part up. Um, these are, again, some slides, all of which are available to you about um, some of the key uh, pieces. This is the uh, paradigm shift. Uh, it really is a paradigm shift when you're focused on uh, the deficits of a parent as compared to the strengths of a family, uh, when you're focused on uh, empowering parents uh, versus um, confronting parents. Uh, but this is a nice uh, summary of uh, those kinds of changes. Uh, this slide is important because uh, PFR and the Children and Family Futures really helped us to change our orientation, to see ourselves as uh, our families, as consumers of services in the community, and that through data and collaboration and coordination, we could be asking more of our partners as we put out more, they need to put out more, and we able to say specifically what it is that we were lacking. This is a, a typical uh, circle of engagement. Um, if, we, uh, if, we, if parents get what they need um, and they know what, the, what they have to do, then we can become, uh, we, we start focusing together on, on how we make progress. I, I like this uh, slide, but I'm not going to linger with it. This is uh, a point that I've made earlier. It couldn't be uh, more emphasized than, than I've made it. It's essential. Okay, Jen, all you. Jennifer? Thanks. Yeah, sorry about that. Thanks. Um, thanks. Thanks, everybody. Um, I just wanted to um, just quickly go over um, a set of resources that the Capacity Building Center for States um, has to support you in this area. So um, we have the Becoming a Family Focus System, um, and it's a collection of user-friendly resources that's designed to help teams assess and amplify positive agency culture and climate, identify areas that need attention, and implement strategies to bring about meaningful and sustainable improvements. Um, and so right now, um, there are three products available. Um, the Assessing Culture and Climate, which provides foundational information and step-by-step -step guidance for assessing how agency culture and climate support family engagement, continuity of relationships, and collaborative development of services to meet families' needs. And managers can use this brief to learn about basic concepts, form a team, choose or develop assessment tools, and conduct an assessment and analyze the results. 
And then um, the next resource we have is strategies for building a culture for a service collaboration um, that really presents strategies to establish, support, and reinforce culture and climate for collaborative development of a service array that's responsive to families and youth. Um, and then we have strategies for building a culture to partner with families. Um, and that really you know, helps um, offer some strategies to establish support and reinforce agency culture and climate um, that's supportive of family engagement and continuity of relationships of children in care. And then later this summer, um, we are going to have a few other um, resources, a couple other resources become available. Um, the How We Partner with the Community to Improve Service Options podcast series, and that's going to highlight real stories from the field around how agencies are changing their organizational culture from compliance um, to a collaborative. And then um, How We Become a Family-Friendly Agency animated video series is going to follow the experience of child welfare staff, stakeholders, and family leaders um, as they implement strategies to shift culture and climate. And then we'll also have an Improving Culture Begins with Leaders tip sheet. So please stay tuned for that. Please visit our website. You'll see that at the end for the resources that are available. Um, so next we are going to um, move towards our Q&A, our question and answer session. Um, so the first question, and I'll, I'll put this out to um, any, of, any of our presenters. Um, Somebody was asking a question around funding, guidance on funding um, for a program like this. So does anybody have some thoughts for them on that? So um, a key thing for us was sustaining our um, services. So the, like we said, the initial services uh, for safe care and strengthening family came from the uh, PFR grant. But we have the, but then we also had the vision of making those part of our preventive services within child welfare. So we've been able to sustain those that way. And I think somebody asked about Family First, so I think Family First funds would easily be able to be used for those types of services. Um, some of our other services, like child parent psychotherapy, um, actually can be. Uh, we do training for our mental health services, and then they're able to bill through Medicaid. Um, so a lot of heavy emphasis on bringing in interventions and training agencies to then be able to, to use other funding sources. Thanks, guys. So uh, Jennifer lost her audio, so I am jumping in to kind of help facilitate this Q&A here. Um, Judge, there was a question from one of our uh, participants, Yolanda Bennett. She, she said that I believe you spoke about a team approach, and she wondered who is on the team and are the parents a part of the team? Yeah, that's a great uh, question. Thank you. We, we, uh, we feel like we're successful when the parents consider us their team, but they are not on our team. This is a professionals only. It's uh, the parents' attorneys, the attorney for the children, um, DSS caseworkers and their, um, their supervisor and their attorney uh, and then the various other uh, service providers. So we've got about 20 people in the room when we're having these discussions. The way that works is uh, prior to a weekly court session, um, actually the day before a weekly court session, we spend about three hours going through our cases for the day, probably about 30 cases on the calendar, 35 cases on the calendar for the next day, and we spend three hours discussing those. Great. Thanks for answering that, Judge, Judge Rowley. And then there's one other question um, here, and, and for any of you, really, um, from Emily Voss. How do you format your all-female and or your all-male sessions different than your typical format in the courtroom? Um, we just they it's only our fathers that are present in the courtroom and only our mothers present in the courtroom. Um, allowing us to give them the time, all of our time and energy and support during those sessions. Um, and, you know, we, we have some incentives available for them. Um, our Amazing Dads graduation was actually done in the same time that we had our all-male court session. So I was able to show the Amazing Dads program to our other dads and have the support of that. Um, and our moms will generally get a flower or something of that nature to emphasize the 
being a mom and that they are still a mom no matter what, if the children are in the home or not. Yeah, and I, I think that um, I would just encourage creativity around that. We, um, we kind of just came up with it, but um, I, I think it's really been uh, successful. Great, thanks for, for sharing that. And then there was one other question around the, the models that you're using again. So uh, they noted that you identified from Jessica Roscoe. Um, she identified that you had CPP, safe care, and then was trying to remember the other. And just an FYI for all of our participants today, we will have some resources that have been shared uh, from the Tompkins County and CF Futures team that will be in the resources pod when we pull that up here in just a few minutes as we begin to close out our session today. Um, but if you all could just answer that quick question on the models again, um, and then we will um, be prepared to transition. Yeah, the single, the three biggest changes we met programming, child and parent psychotherapy, uh, is strengthening families, which is also a version of it, is celebrating families, similar uh, kind of models, and then safe care, which ultimately ended up being uh, housed with our public health nurses, and now it's being offered to other members of the community, um, an in-home uh, family uh, support model. Great. Thanks, Judge Rally. And I, now I'm going to turn it back over to Jennifer Marcelli to close us out for the rest of our session today. Thanks, Nicole. Um, so on the next slide, we wanted to um, let folks know about um, an upcoming event that we have. Um, it's our Child Welfare, Child Welfare Virtual Expo. Um, please join us on Thursday, September 19th. Um, this year's Child Welfare Virtual Expo theme is uh, around effectiveness in child welfare, our role in improving the lives of children and families. And so um, on your screen, you'll see how you can register. We really encourage you guys um, to register and attend the sessions there. And then um, we also just wanted um, folks to know how you can stay connected with the center. So if you are, are not already signed up for our, um, our Gov delivery system, um, this keeps you up to date on um, all of the center resources, events, um, and things coming up. So please, please sign up for that if you're not already so you can um, stay, stay in touch. Um, and then we also have a link for an evaluation survey for today's event. We really appreciate any feedback that um, you guys can provide us on how to continue to make um, our events even better. Um, and then finally, here is just our um, contact information for anything that you may need. So thank you all very much for coming today. We are at the end of our scheduled time, so we will be finishing this webinar shortly. Feel free to contact us using our website, capacity.childwelfare.gov slash states. That's C-A-P-A-C-I-T-Y dot C-H-I-L-D W-E-L-F-A-R-E dot G-O-V slash S-T-A-T-E-S. You can also contact us by your email address, capacityinfo at icf.com. That's C-A-P-A-C-I-T-Y I-N-F-O at icf.com, or by our phone number, 844-222-0272. Thank you for joining us, and have a great day.